Okay, I'd like to uh, call to order the Urban Design Commission meeting for Wednesday, December 9th, 2009. Can we have a roll call? Mark Kimmerer. Here. James Doherty. Here. Douglas Gazek. Here. Patrick Coleman. Here. Andrew Garcia. Here. Patricia Joyner. Here. Jim Sawhill. Here. Jeff Dinwiddie. I didn't receive uh, minutes in the packet, so there's no minutes to approve. So we'll move on to uh, disclosures. Does anyone have any disclosures? Hearing and seeing none, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Um, we need a motion to approve the consent agenda. It's been moved. Commissioner Gassick seconded. Commissioner Kimmerer, um, is there anyone, any, anyone who would like to pull case? Um, yes, Mr. Chair, I'd like to pull case. Um, I don't see the number. The only one on there. The only one on there. 09 109 108. 108. 108. Do we have the petitioner here? Only one case. We have to wait till we hear it, and then it all gets. Uh, we're having a little bit of a disagreement about how we pull this item off when there's only one there's only one item on the consent agenda we have a motion on the floor That's correct. And then I, I can, I'm happy to share him when there's an item when you approve the consent agenda everything under the consent agenda is approved without changes if you pull something off of it you have to act on that separately and we have a motion on the floor right now to approve the consent agenda and we've pulled the only item yeah and just redo withdraw, it withdraw the motion yes and just redo that okay so the motion is withdrawn so you had a question for the petitioner um, well, first, I think it's a beautiful landscape, and I really appreciated all the um, buffering and the um, wooded areas that were retained. But I was concerned about the maintenance because it is such an extensive landscape. I think I counted 667 trees. and um, So it says that horticulture would provide maintenance after the first year. And recently we've gotten... Um, comments from horticulture on projects they're going to review and they gave an estimate of what they actually would able to do and how much it would cost so i just want to know if they saw this and and what they're going to be able to provide and if if this is still going to look good in three or four years or uh well i'm ralph friends i'm the landscape architect for the project and that's r-e-n-t-c and uh sure maybe you can answer have has uh Person that horticulture seen the plans. I know they saw the preliminary plans. Yeah, we haven't gotten. We didn't get any review comments indicating that they had seen the project. And I might just add, a lot of this is naturalized plant material. I, I think we're doing much more formal planting just along the the road corridor and against the the two building fronts on the south side of the buildings. Everything else we're trying to naturalize on the site. Oh, so all the shrubs and the perennials and 
So it, well, I was curious if they're going to be able to water then. There's water, there water, water on the site or? Well, there is water uh, at the existing police facility. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine that there will be exterior hose bibs on the new building that's, that's um, going to be built, the APD evidence and forensics building. Okay, I, well, I didn't think, I guess it's in there. I just would suggest maybe it can go to them again so that they, I think it's real important for us. We've had a lot of discussions because the maintenance is so important, especially when we're spending nearly a million dollars on a landscape plan that that it that it functions like it should and it reaches maturity. And with something this big, I'd just like to see that they really are going to be able to, it's going to be watered more than just the first year. For that many trees, and that they're they're going to be able to do it, I, even more so with budget cuts. And I, I don't know if there's other options for contracting for work, like we do for all of the other kinds of maintenance we do. I would imagine there's opportunities for contracting maintenance out. I'm not quite sure how that works with the muni, but you know the maintenance. Um, that is one of the reasons we limited um, uh, Schedule A and law seating. And here, there's very little lawn maintenance. Everything else is native seed. I think the only place that we have uh, Schedule A is right by the existing APD uh, front doors. There's just a little bit of lawn, so yeah, we did take the, that into consideration. So, and and one of the conditions from staff was uh, moose fencing, so is that yes. going to work for... Okay, thank you. Patricia, did you want to add a condition? Um, yeah, I'm thinking about adding oh, okay. say that. Still walking through procedure. Uh, what, the way I understand, we have one one item on the consent agenda. When we pulled that off, that put it on the regular agenda. So now we're acting on the case as a separate case, and there won't be a vote on the consent agenda at this point. But usually, when we pulled them off, we've had to make a motion for approval and vote right. On it. So if you're going to if you're going to suggest additional conditions or any additional language, we're handling this as part of our regular agenda now. We, we've pulled it off the consent agenda, which basically means there is no consent agenda cases. So at this point, I'm wondering if there's any conditions that you're um, that you're suggesting adding, or were you just getting clarification and we were just? Um, I think I'll just get clarification, and I, I, they know my concerns, and I'll leave it at that if it's going to be complicated. So then, what I'd be looking for is then a motion for approval of this case as okay. is. Why don't you craft that motion so that we can make sure that if there's anything that you need to have addressed, we'll get it captured. Okay. Then I'll move for approval of case 2009-108, the final landscape plan review for the uh, fire for the um, Anchorage Police Department, and um, find that it does meet the conditions as described in the staff report with um, staff recommendations one through four. And a fifth condition that the uh, horticulture section be asked to review the plan and develop a maintenance plan for the facility. Is 
So we're looking for a second. It's been seconded by Commissioner Sahil. Any discussion on the motion? Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, I, I would uh, just like to get on the record in, in reviewing um, the case. I would find that uh, uh, Petitioner has uh, satisfied the conditions and, and concerns of the, the board under the preliminary approval, and uh, they've addressed all those comments. And uh, I believe that the, uh, the, the case does meet the standards uh, for approval. And based on that, I will be supporting the motion. Okay. Commissioner Kimmer. Uh, thank you. I will also be supporting the motion for approval. Um, the department recommendations one through four seem appropriate, and it was a good catch by uh, Commissioner Joyner to add the fifth one. I don't see anything in the plans that uh, contradict Title 21, so I will support the motion. Anyone else wish to speak to the motion? Is there any objection to passing, passing the motion? Hearing, seeing none, passes unanimously. So we'll move on now to case 2009-151, a site plan review for Valley of the Moon Park. We have a staff report. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is the concept review of the site plan and landscape plan for Valley of the Moon Park improvements. The project seeks to improve pedestrian access into the park, views into the park, and the park experience. A new, uh, along 17th Avenue, there's a new section of uh, chain link fence uh, to separate the tot lot from West 17th Avenue. The new fence section is an opportunity to introduce a design element into the fence or the barrier. The children's forest has been deleted from the project due to budget issues. Owing to this deletion, the adult fitness equipment location may need to be reconsidered, reconsidered as its placement was decided based on providing adult supervision of children in the children's forest. Perhaps it could be relocated near the playground so that adults can exercise while supervis supervising their children. And there was, a, a, in terms of the um, department recommendations, there were two um, conditions needing land use review. One was for the ADA accessible parking, and the other was for the need to provide paved to parking. Uh, third condition was consider introducing a design element into the new fence section along West 17th Avenue, and a fourth one consider relocating the adult fitness equipment station. What's the nature of this extra packet that we received today? I think it's just some late comments that came in. I think mainly they're from AWU. So they're not additional community council testimony or no, anything like that? No. Is the petitioner here? Do you have anything that you wish to clarify or uh, no, present? It's, it's pretty much spelled out there. It was 35 percent design. Are there any questions for the petitioner? Um, yes, Mr. Rance, do you have any objection to the staff recommendations? Or yeah, no. They're fine as written. Yep. Thank you. Commissioner Gass? I just had a question about the existing restroom and why it's locked here around. And 
um, what the purpose of that is, and, and maybe that could, if it is a usable space or usable restroom, if the port of toilets could maybe go away. Um, I, I couldn't quite hear you. You're asking why the existing restroom is not usable? Not here, right. I, I think it's mainly for vandalism purposes. Has it been explored maybe? Use that facility rather than installing new porta potties. In um, the, the parks department last year told me that they were exploring um, the idea of using a part-time attendant and opening that up for during um, scheduled use of the park. But I think we would also have the porta potties as well. Okay, there would be both. But I'm just looking at through that attractiveness factor of the. The visual attractiveness of the landscape that would definitely be beneficial to rid the landscape of the porta potties. Well, hopefully, with our screening, will somewhat help that. It's helpful, but not quite all the way there. Any other questions? I have a question. Is that new picnic shelter area, is that going to interfere with the existing field? I mean, if you're going to have a picnic area, I'm sure you're going to have kids running all around and are people playing on that sports field going to? Is that out of the range? I didn't really have a scale to scale it. Yeah, it's hard to tell by the drone, but it is, it's quite a, quite a distance from the field. It shouldn't have any impact at all. And then another question I have, what type of equipment are you guys looking to have on that adult recreational area? What type of what? Equipment. It said there was going to be adult exercise equipment. Um, it's um, a different station. Manufacturers make playground equipment for adults, essentially, but it's exercise equipment, so you can go there and do sit-ups, and it has an informative and interpretive signage that tells you, you know, what to expect with your heart rate and that, that type of thing. So it's nothing that could pose, like, a, a fall hazard or anything to children? Um, even with um, adult exercise equipment, you do have to look at the fall zones, so yes. And then the other question I had is in that existing playground rehabilitation area, you're going to have a, a bunch of asphalt with dedicated play areas and curbs. How is the drainage going to work in that area? These curbs are all existing. Um, so we're just going to work the grades around, around the existing curbs. But isn't it existing, like, just earthwork now? You're going to put a non-permeable surface down with asphalt. So where's the water flow going to go to? It'll flow away from the playground to the uh, existing lawn that's around there. And there's quite a bit of grade differential in that area, so okay, it shouldn't be a problem. That's all I really had. So the question is, if I can just intervene quickly sure. um, you know we're we're sort of electronically preparing the 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 minute records so that if we're going to speak let's use the tools so that you show up as the speaker um, and and that way we've got a, a better record of, of what's been happening so with that go ahead thanks um, I'm curious about the adult fitness equipment in the children's forest. I realize that the children's forest has been deleted from the project. I don't know if that's going to be a permanent decision or if that might come back to the design at some point. Do you have any idea or is it? I think as part of this project, it will not be coming back due to budget. Okay. I think perhaps as a future volunteer effort, it might come back okay. at some point, but not. Do you think you'll end up, do you think you'll end up putting the fitness equipment back by the existing playground then? If you know, we're at 35%, and if budget allows any adult exercise equipment at this point, it probably will go over in that area. Okay. I thought it was an interesting spot to put the children's forest and adult fitness equipment there. It's a, there's a lot of, it's a, actually a pretty active intersection, and there's a bench actually that just sits north of the children's forest, and there's, it's usually occupied by uh, inebriates and stuff. So I, I didn't know if it was an attempt to kind of tie the whole park together and, and get a little more activity over in that area. Well, that's what it was, yes, Got originally. It. Okay, thanks. Other questions? I had one that's just sort of general in nature. Um, we have a couple of park improvements um, that we're looking at, and, uh, and we've seen with the, the, the Cuddy Family Park as well. This move towards the portable toilets, and in, in this 
case in particular, we, we have a toilet facility with permanent plumbing, um, and you've mentioned that vandalism is, is an issue. Um, what is it that, I guess I'm, I'm trying to get my mind fully around sort of the operational requirements and why it's advantageous to have the porta potties as opposed to permanent facilities. For example, you know, the roadside stops have SSTs or we're investing money to screen these sort of turquoise porta potties. Why aren't we putting that into a suitable, a maintainable, non vandalism prone uh, facility as opposed to trying to screen? Is it, is it a contract thing where it's easy to pay somebody to service the toilets? I, I don't quite understand. What well, I, I really can't speak for the Parks Department, and I think that's more of a policy issue with the Parks Department. So, I mean, I, I guess uh, in reviewing these, we're, we're going to expect to see more and more of these sort of contract porta potties with screening walls around them instead of permanent bricks and mortar I, I would toilet facilities. That's the case, yes. And you're not able to tell us what the basis for that well, is? Well, it's my understanding uh, that it's vandalism issues. And, you know, how do you get around that in the parks? There's, I, and again, I'm just trying to understand. So the vandalism issue becomes the contractor's problem who is supplying the porta potties instead of, instead of, and, and you're, you're trying to get around a problem, but I don't see how the porta potties are any less vandal prone than your permanent facilities if you construct the permanent facilities properly. And, um, and I, and I don't hear a lot of discussion about what the proper Design of uh, public facilities are. It's just let's use porta potties instead of. I mean, we've invested quite a bit of money in plumbed facilities and a comfort station there that we have locked up year round. Uh, now we're not deciding to demolish this facility, so maybe there's hope that it will be brought back online someday. I don't know. I just don't quite understand, and I see this being repeated in other parks, and I. I'd like to have a better understanding of that because we're asked to review the appropriateness or the aesthetics of this solution. We have Suzanne Little here from the Parks Department. Maybe she can shed some light on that. Suzanne Little, Senior Parks Planner with the Parks and Recreation Department. Good evening. I understand your concern and uh, a, a concrete block restroom facilities take way more maintenance than uh, even if we handle the porta potties ourselves, which we did up until two years ago, we that we own them and we maintain them. Now they are contracted out, as you mentioned. Uh, a concrete toilet requires locking at night. As you know, we lost about 30 positions from our department in the in our budget cycle uh, just lately. So we are really, we lack the capacity to lock and unlock gates, restrooms, et cetera, et cetera, at our uh, park facilities. It's, it's mostly a capacity issue. Uh, at this point, I do understand your concern. And obviously, uh, a permanent facility is much more desirable, from, especially from a visual perspective than a portable toilet facility, but unfortunately, it's what we can afford. So is it um, my understanding then with your contracted porta potties, you don't lock those? Those are open 24 hours a day? That's correct. And there's not a vandalism issue associated with that? There or is, but it, like it you said, the, the contractor. contractor deals with it. Okay. Okay. Well, that's answered my question. Uh, Francis, you had a question? Through the chair, I had a question for Ms. Little. So if you had a porta potty um, right next to uh, a concrete uh, uh, bathroom, then the porta potty wouldn't be vandalized as often or the repairs would be less? Or if you could speak into the mic. Uh, and, and if you don't know the answer to these questions, then, then perhaps um, just a, uh, you know, a simple email that could be shared with all. It's an interesting question. I don't think there's any relationship to the frequency of 
vandalism of porta potties dependent upon where they're placed. But I think that the point that you made earlier was that um, uh, porta potties are vandalized less. No, that's not what I intended to say. They are vandalized at whatever rate they're vandalized. It's just that the contractor deals with it and our uh, park staff do not. So if, if I am understanding properly, if you built vault toilets for the park that were open 24 hours a day that were of the exact same size and dimension as the porta potties, because you own those facilities, you'd be responsible for maintaining them. So any vandalism that came with them would be the park's problem. Whereas contracting them out, you're able to sort of include the cost of maintenance and repairs in that contract. Yes, and um, you know, we also have had issues with people using uh, the concrete block facilities to basically live in. So we do have uh, a, it, it is needed that we lock them um, to prevent that issue from occurring. But if you had permanent vault toilets, for example, of the same dimension as the porta potties that you contract for, you, you wouldn't, it would be a net zero in terms of the issues of people using them for housing or, or whatever. Um, it's just, in, in my mind, the, the reason for the porta potties is because there's a contract relationship that you can have for maintenance, whereas if you built permanent facilities, you would, I suppose you could contract out the maintenance of permanent facilities. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to find out what it takes to get permanent, well-designed facilities in our parks instead of these porta potties. Um, now there may be other compelling factors is maybe they're scalable if you have a big event you can bring in more porta potties and they don't seem out of place I don't know but it I'd seems like a to... properly designed park would take the design aesthetics of the toilets mm -hmm. and the functional requirements of the toilets whether it's vandalism or housing vagrants or whatever into account and come up with a design solution that that meets that I'd be glad to uh, do some more investigation about that question. Um, I haven't really thought about it very much myself, but I'm sure there are those in our department who have. It's in my concern, not so much on this project, but I'm seeing a pattern where this has been somehow determined to be the appropriate solution for our public parks. And I'm not sure I'm in agreement that that's the only solution or the most appropriate solution. So that's why we beat this one to death. Commissioner Joyner. Well, you alluded to the question I had a little bit ago. Was, I was just wondering if we'd ever looked at contracting the maintenance of the permanent facilities because I noticed the same thing. At most of the restrooms and parks in this town, they've been locked up for 30 years. And when you travel to other towns, they all have bathrooms, it seems, and they have this homeless people in the same issue. So... There must be some sort of solution. And I, I know Parks has real budget issues now, but I would be curious about the difference in contracting for somebody to be sort of a watch person and door locker as opposed to transporting porta potties around. Commissioner Garsha? I hate to beat the pot porta potty thing up anymore, but uh, I do have a question. So, like, on a construction job site, they say a porta potty is good for 10 adults for five working days on average. Like, how many porta potties are you guys envisioning for a facility of this size that has that much activity? Because I drive, go by that park all the time in the summer, and there's hundreds of people there all the time. I think there's just, uh, I'm trying to recall from this last summer, I think there was just one there this last summer. Really? Uh, but it's serviced frequently. It's like, what's frequently, like daily? I would have to investigate and get back to you. I don't know. <laughs> That's really all I had. Thank you. Any other questioner, questions for the petitioner? Okay, thank you. Uh, matter rests with us.
I'll entertain a motion. Commissioner Kimra? Yes, I uh, move to approve case 2009-151 uh, as meeting the requirements for concept review of site and landscape plan for Valley of the Moon Park improvements. Um, I'd like the, mo the motion to include department recommendations one through four. And that's been seconded by Commissioner Coleman. Um, I'm going to support the motion. Uh, I think it's a heavily used park. Uh, I think everybody here is probably somewhat familiar with it. Uh, the improvements will be uh, greatly appreciated. I can see the, uh, the direction the designers are going, trying to bring that uh, ball field area to the east into the park more so, because it is somewhat separated and has a main thoroughfare of the trails going north-south through there. Uh, I don't see that there's anything conflicting with Title 21, uh, so I will support it. Commissioner Gassick? I'd like to offer up an amendment, an additional condition. Okay, and that would be uh, consider using existing restrooms and evaluate the need for the new portage ons Is that acceptable? That is acceptable. acceptable. Is that an acceptable amendment to you? It's it's a recommendation, right? It's yeah, not a that, yeah. Requirement. Okay. Anyone else wish to speak to the motion? Any objection to passing the motion? Hearing and seeing none. Motion passes. Next, we have case 2009-152, site plan and landscape plan review for Jewel Lake Park, pedestrian and park improvements. Can we get a staff report? Yes, the, the, um, this project seeks to improve uh, pedestrian access, views into the park, and the park experience. The park enjoys winter use. Um, ice skating is a popular activity along with an ice fishing event for kids. The lake is located some distance from the picnic shelter and there doesn't appear to be any seating available for skaters to change from street shoes to skates. Seating should be provided even if only seasonal when the beach is frozen near the lake edge to make for a more enjoyable skating experience. And then there was one department recommendation, consider providing winter amenities near the lake edge, such as seating for, for changing from street shoes to skates. Do we have any questions for the petitioner? We can move right to a motion, if not. Does, does the petitioner wish to make a presentation? Okay. I do have a question for the petitioner. Okay. Um, I guess I have a couple questions. First is, um, on the existing conditions map, there shows some um, uh, parking lot lighting, mm -hmm. and they kind of disappear on your proposed uh, conditions map. I was wondering if you're going to do any lighting improvements in the existing parking lot. Uh, no, we're not planning. We're keeping those poles uh, as, as is. Any plans to change to white light or? or uh, uh, not, not as part of this. Not as part of this. And going along Project. with that, have you evaluated the lights along the shoreline that light the, uh, the the skating use in the winter? No, we have not, but we just have a uh, we just got a consultant on board to do that, so we will be looking at that for the next submission. Okay, so you'll be evaluating the the, right. the lighting along there. And my next question was, I I know during some of the winter activities, I've seen vehicles down on the lake, uh, getting down to put in the. Uh, 
How are vehicles going to get down to the lake in your new design? Uh, we've just slid the maintenance gate down to the... There's a, a maintenance gate at the, at the, uh, what would that be the northwest corner of the parking lot. We're sliding it to the northeast corner of the parking lot. Okay, and then the vehicles just drive down the trail? Uh, the vehicles would drive uh, on the lawn, which is what they do right now. Okay. Across the trail. Okay. All right, thank you. Those are my questions. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. It's time for a motion. Mr. Kimner? Yes, I move to approve case 2009-152 as meeting uh, requirements for concept review by the Urban Design Commission uh, for site and landscape. And I would like the motion to include the department recommendation number one. See, that's been seconded. Um, I'm going to support this motion. It looks like some very logical improvements to the park, another heavily used park. Um, and I see nothing that conflicts with Title 21 within the design. Thank you. Commissioner Coleman. Well, I think it's uh, great that uh, staff, the staff recommendation and the discussion here is focused a bit on winter use. I think we need to do more of that with our parks. So uh, I'm very much in favor of this project and that um, access, for example, for the vehicles has been considered. Anyone else wish to speak? Mr. Joyner? I just wanted to comment. I think this is a great project to not, without spending a whole lot of money, just to really kick up what's there another notch and make it a lot more attractive and accessible. And um, this and the last part, too, I think these are real improvements to areas that are well loved and used. And I'm glad to see parks taking on those kind of projects. Anyone else wish to speak? Before we vote, any objection to the motion? Hearing seeing none, motion passes. Next on the agenda is case 2009-159, landscape plan review for pump station upgrade for Chester Creek pump station number two. We have a staff report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, late comments were received for this case uh, and laid on the table this evening. Um, one is from uh, AWU and the other one is from uh, the South Edition uh, Community Council. The, the uh, comments from the uh, South Edition Community Council um, are of substance and uh, I'll be reading from portions of them um, at the end of my uh, presentation. I'd like to begin by um, pointing out that this is uh, a case that the Commission has uh, not seen previously. It was submitted um, for a final review because of the, um, uh, the, the really the minor changes or the, the, the value of the project is, is not great. And uh, uh, it was seen that it could be submitted as, uh, or the applicant submitted it as final. Um, so you will not be seeing this case again. Um, it's useful to have the plans out uh, in front of you for discussion um, about fences and other things that will come up. Um, the petitioner is here to, uh, um, and has a presentation prepared for the, the commission. Um, there's a chain link fence on the southeast side of the, of the building uh, which will be removed and replaced with a metal wire fence. The section of the fence will be moved approximately 10 feet uh, moved to approximately 10 feet from the trail at the closest point. Barbed wire will be removed from the southeast section of the fence and kept in place for the remainder. Uh, the interpretive sign will be moved closer to the trail also. Uh, the department recommends approval of the, public, the final 
uh, public facility uh, site plan and landscape plan for the AWU Chester Creek pump station number two, subject to conditions one through six on pages two and three. Um, there's, uh, it's worth noting there's a condition number three. This is resolve the location of the fence with the non-motorized transportation coordinator. That's uh, condition three. Um, I wanted to uh, point out uh, uh, some of the questions that were raised by the community council. Uh, the Southeast Community Council, uh, uh, in their first uh, paragraph, uh, says a pre-existing drainage swale lies immediately to the west of the building. Their proposed 20-foot wide gravel driveway will cross this drainage swale from the coastal trail to the existing west um, actuator uh, room door. Um, we question the need for the placement of a 20-foot wide uh, gravel driveway, which is proposed to serve a 3-foot wide access door. The placement of a 15-foot wide uh, gravel uh, driveway would be more conducive to the proposed improvements um, to the site aesthetics. We non-concur with the 20-foot wide uh, gravel driveway and recommend a 15-foot wide gravel driveway as appropriate to the site and adequate for the proposed maintenance use. Um, the other uh, point that uh, they raised um, that uh, is, uh, I, is, is worth discussing is that uh, paragraph number two, they say, um, we question the need for the existing six-foot high uh, chain link fence south from the pump house adjacent to the east side of the coastal trail to the intersection point of the existing fence immediately to the west of the Alaska Railroad Embankment. Currently, a three-foot wide modified chain link fence is situated immediately to the west of the coastal trail. The placement of this three-foot high fence is for safety reasons to prevent people from entering the adjacent mudflats extending to a six-foot high fence along the east side of the coastal trail will impact on the proposed placement of addition, additional vegetation to improve the site visual impacts. It will also cause a tunnel effect existing, uh, exiting the north uh, portal railroad undercrossing of the coastal trail with the existing six foot, three foot wide fences located on the west side of the coastal trail and the placement of the six foot wide high fence, the six foot high fence on the east side of the coastal trail. We concur with the removal of the barbed wire from the existing site security fence. We propose the existing uh, fence be kept in place and be extended to the south no more than 30 feet from the pump station building, avoiding the existing elders, alders. Um, from the existing southwest fence corner post, make a 90 degree turn to the due east, to the due east and tie into the existing fence post, gate post located adjacent to the Alaska Railroad Embankment. We feel any proposed extension of the existing fence adjacent to the coastal trail will negatively impact the aesthetics of the area and will detract from the proposed um, improvements. Um, in conclusion, um, it uh, might be worth asking um, the petitioner uh, the need for the, the fence at all and if the, the fence is needed for security, um, uh, then what, what sort of fence would be appropriate, what location would be appropriate. Um, this is uh, uh, public land, um, the public money for this project. Um, it's a question of, it's, it's not quite the same maybe as treated as a private property where um, a private property owner may want uh, to create sort of defensible space or some of these ideas of um, a private space uh, that may or may not be justified in a case of a, a pump station in in this particular um, sort of high uh, high, visi high visibility location. That's all I have. Thank you. Do we have a presentation from the petitioner? I'm Todd Kerr with Anchorage Water Wastewater Utility. I'm the uh, project manager. I work in the engineering division. And Elise Huggins with Earthscape. We're the project landscape architect. And just for the record, um, I'm also president of the South Edition Community Council and did remove myself completely from all discussions during the review of this project. Um, I think most
also we'd just like to discuss that this is a fairly straightforward project for the utility. Um, it is mostly a roofing project and fixing um, minor repairs on, on the building. Um, the landscaping was designed um, over, the original landscape plan was designed over a decade ago. Um, at the time, they weren't able to implement that design, so being able to implement it now was, was seen as uh, something nice that the, the utility could do. Going to the conditions, um, the conditions we find are all acceptable that staff has written with the exception um, of condition number four. One of the things that happens when we delete details, staking details, we end up with a contractor on site that says he's not going to warranty the tree if he can't stake it. So we do like to include staking details on our sheets. Um, if you read the detail carefully, it does say in needy, in windy conditions. And we have been, we have had several situations where we've had a landscape contractor try to void a warranty um, if he's not allowed to stake the trees. Um, so that's something we, we would like you to consider as a commission. Um, other than that, we find the, the conditions are, are acceptable. Do you, do you have anything to say about the fence relocation? Oh, yeah, I do. Thanks. Um, the, um, uh, um, Todd came to the community council meeting, and they um, they actually agreed. This is part of the potential to close the neighborhood. The basis for that was security and it was to um, allow a vehicle to do a Excuse me, Elise. This is all recorded electronically. We have to have you speak into the microphone. Here, I'll hold it. Yeah. Okay. So let me repeat that. The, the original fence location that was proposed to the community council meeting was at the tightest point 10 feet away from the trail. Um, it wrapped around following, dropped back from the trail over 30 feet to allow a truck to turn in and access the, the utilities facility. After the community, during the community council meeting, what the utility agreed to do was to um, bring the fence back here. So depending on what the commission decides tonight, that fence design will be revised to come. It will miss this existing alder clump. So the utility has agreed to bring that fence back in here. And um, Todd can explain to you for the reason, but, but it is primarily security and, and secure, securing the site um, for the utility. I can hold it if you want. Yeah, so I think we resolved most of what was commented uh, about the fence, truthfully, uh, by what she's saying, uh, from what I recall of the meaning. But we do need to retain the fence. Uh, the site is a controlled access site, and there's no reason to change that. Um, we are removing some fencing as part of the project that's interior to the parking area to the east of the building. But the fencing around the perimeter will remain so that it's, you know, just enclosed the building area there, much like it is right now. Um, but uh, we're renovating the gate, so our vector truck, which is a large vehicle with the hose that we need to maintain the uh, well off the back of the facility, it'll have to come around. And it has a really large turning radius, so actually moving it back here will give us a little more area to turn. And speaking of that drive, because it has such a large turning radius, I'm not sure 15 feet is going to be enough to get its wheels in. The door being three feet really has no relation to what we need for the driveway itself. Okay. Um, Commissioner Gosha. I have a question. All right. In reading the literature um, about the project, um, it was mentioned that lots of times people drive offside the trail and I know I've been on this trail a lot as lots of people had and this is a really crowded section of the trail and I was wondering why the vegetation had to butt up to it. The vegetation has actually already been revised. It will be located um, at least three feet from, from the edge of the trail. Um, which The trail right now has about a two foot shoulder. So, so the shrubs will be about three feet away. The trees are uh, at least ten feet. I think eight eight to ten feet away from the edge of the trail. Okay, so they're not going to butt right up to it. The, the only place that we recommended that the trees stay a little bit closer is um, right where that, that viewing the interpretive pull out is. Okay. 
that's, that's really all I had. Commissioner Gasek? I just had a question about the community council's request to change the driveway width from 20 feet to 15 feet. Is that possible in, in the design? Uh, our civil engineer that uh, looked at the access requirements for the vector truck with the design program says we need that size. For that? For that vector truck in its turning radius and wheelbase. Okay. Other questions of the petitioner? I have a question. Thanks. Um, so it sounds like you're willing to move that fence line to the north. Am I hearing that correctly? That's correct. We're, the, the goal, we can meet the community's desire for, for moving the fence as was stated in the letter from South Edition. Okay. I'm curious if you have a, f I guess the reason is to bring a truck down the driveway that's to the north and then come out and around. That's why that's, then there's no way to br come bring it on the north side of the building. Or, which is much no. closer. No. no, there's no other way in there. There's a huge hill over here and uh, tracks. The, the only access is across the tracks where the lift station access is at for at least a few miles. Okay. Yeah. And to the planning design, it, I have some of the concerns uh, Commissioner Garcia had. Is it's, it's a turning, it's a radius there. You can get going quite fast on a bike coming from the north and just some concerns about being able to see or it'd be nice to see through there if you're if you're on the trail yeah, they originally we had put the plantings as a screening mechanism for the fence with the fence moving here we'll actually take some of these plant materials and wrap them and take some of the other plant materials and we've talked to the community council about softening this edge um, so the plants will follow the fence a little bit and then wrap down um, so, so that at that pinch point you will lose, um, you won't have a site, any kind of off -skirt. Um and We did also try to use plants that were low and plants that, the reason we used birch trees was just for that similar effect, they're 20 foot tall birch trees and we did, um, the specs do call out for limiting them up quite high to allow visibility around that. that sounds good, thanks. Other questions? I, I had uh, one, I think this is for, for you, Francis, that it seems like a unilateral decision has been made about this being a, a one-stop final approval, um, yet we don't have the final design. Um, and I think that puts us in kind of an interesting situation here. I mean, we're talking about some fairly significant changes of pulling the landscaping away from the trail, wrapping it around a new fence line and a new alignment. Is there a, um, a schedule-driven, um, um, is there some sort of hardship that's going to be a result of us not seeing this for final? Well, to, to be frank, I, I wasn't aware of any of these changes. And my question um, that I put in, I was going to ask the petitioner, are there any other changes that we're not aware of? Uh, I, I um, before you answer that, I, you know, when, when, this, when this project was submitted and it was assigned to me, um, uh, it would, they had asked for a final review. I thought these were the final plans. Um, uh, if if uh, the commission um, uh, wants to see uh, final plans, is not comfortable with uh, acting on, on on the plans that they're looking at, um, or um, like additional conditions or things. It, if they want to see it again, they can. Um, we could uh, um, uh, postpone the case um, to the next month in order to uh, uh, get copies of the revised plans. Um, uh, I'd, I'd like to give the uh, uh, Ms. Huggins an opportunity to respond. I have a two-part question about hardship in the event of a, you know, a formal coming back with a final plan. The utility, we did ask for final review and final approval at the same time because the utility does have a bid schedule they're trying to meet and they've actually delayed that bid schedule as a result of the UDC meeting. Um, we did think that these were the final plans until we went to the community council meeting and um, we were trying to work, the, the only reason, and the plans haven't changed until tonight's, won't change until tonight's meeting, but the only reason that we're um, amenable to the changes is to meet community needs. So the, the plans haven't been revised since they were submitted. 
um, we've just acknowledged that, that we can meet the community needs. Um, one of the things, what happens if this plan comes back in a month? It does delay AWW's bidding ability, which um, could lose some of the bidding climate that we feel is, is opportune right now. The other thing to consider is when it comes back, um, what will change in terms of your reviews as commissioners? Is, isn't everything that we changed not only part of the public record tonight, but isn't that something that staff could review and make sure that we meet the, the details and, and, and the, the, the conditions that you've done tonight? I guess that was part of our thinking, as long as we have staff's approval and we understand what the commission conditions are, that, that this it's not a no-brainer of a project, but it is a fairly small project, and, and maybe public interest in AWW needs could be best served by, by having this be a final review as long as we can meet the conditions. There was, uh, I don't know, Francis, you're looking to, to speak. There was, you had also made a comment about this being a limited scale or limited scope. Um, and how, do, how does that enter into our, I mean, I would imagine that means it's limited risk of failure or something like that if, if we do jigger around with conditions, um, the, the final design. Well, um, you know, um, in the planning department, I, I have no role in this project. I'm not representing the, you know, I'm just representing, uh, you know, as a reviewer. Um, I'm not familiar with the timelines of the petitioner, even though it's a public agency. I, so, uh, uh, the department has um, no objection to uh, the process that uh, Ms. Huggins uh, suggested of um, following up with the minutes and in the revised plans if the commission is comfortable uh, uh, approving this um, with the uh, changes that she has described. Um, if the commission chooses to uh, postpone it to the next month and, and to uh, see this again, um, the department uh, is, is, is fine with that too. We have uh, we're indifferent. Okay, I, I had understood you to have a position that this project was a good candidate for a single review and that that was somehow being promoted by the department. If, if I may interject, Mr. Chair, um, Elise had called me prior to submitting it and she had described it as a, a pretty straightforward small project and she requested if it could come as a one-time review final project. I asked her a few questions um, to get an idea, more information about the project, but I hadn't actually seen it. Um, and so I, ag I agreed that it sounded like it was a small project. Um, and so we went ahead and did it with uh, a final approval, but there are questions that are arising tonight that it's not really, the design is not really complete because as Ms. Um, Huggins has explained, um, they went to the Community Council after they had submitted the drawings for staff and UDC approval. And so there have been changes since they went to Community Council. And so it, it's really a matter if the Commission is, feels comfortable approving this tonight with added conditions for that staff uh, could review. Or if you want to see it again, then you can see it again. Okay. Thanks. Mr. Sahil. Thirty-five feet. And it would help us to say out um, without damaging the alder because I thought was what the community council specifically requested that the fence be located based on the, the alder that's not removing plants to lo relocate the fence. Sorry, um, that we could go ahead and add an additional condition for uh, relocation of the fence on the south side to address the community council's meet, uh, concern. And I don't have another problem adding another condition to um, update the landscape plan um, to 
um, follow the fence line and, and with that landscape plan to be approved by staff so we can allow this to go forward. It is a relatively minor project and I do understand bid schedules and, and the, the need to stay on those. So I would feel comfortable in this small plan um, to, to go forward with those additional conditions. Mr. Joyner. Um, could you just tell us real briefly, like, what, would you be moving the trees around? You'd just be moving things so that you would block the fencing more? So it would be the same number of plants and trees pretty much? You'd just move them? That was information we, want, we were trying to find out from the commission tonight. Um, if it was important to keep the quantity of plant materials or if they could just be wrapped. And one of the things that we look at, if we simply relocate the fence here and wrap the plant materials, that leaves us with this awkward, um, almost a dead space between the trees. Um, the community council pretty much said they, they wanted the quantity of trees to, to stay the same, but, but they were being fairly reasonable. Did they, I don't know if they mentioned anything else in the letter, Francis. But, um, you mentioned birch. This says aspen, but maybe you meant aspen. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, it is aspen trees because there are existing aspens out there. Thank you. So is there a possibility of adding more aspen? Aspen are fairly narrow trees for screening. That would be up to the, up to the commission. And on the staking, um, it, it still has the requirement for taking the stakes off within a yes, year. Yes, it does. Okay, thank you. Francis. Um, thinking positively about making changes here, um, although it may seem clumsy, I just wanted to say that um, uh, in many cases and in front of other boards and commissions and also with this one, um, people will show up at the meeting that and express concerns that um, – uh, haven't been expressed before, um, so that's new information. And that's kind of like what's happening here. Um, if the um, uh, South Edition Community Council had shown up today and, you know, asked for these changes on the spot, we would either be postponing or adding these conditions to deal with it. So if it's framed that way, this is not um, too atypical. I don't yeah, I mean, I would counter that. I mean, you know, my concern here isn't that this is a complex problem or that it's not beyond our ability to to approve this. It's the usually when we approve something for final, we're seeing the final design. I mean, those types of comments, the way that we've structured this is that we see this generally at the conceptual or schematic design level. We have a nice dialogue about where this project is moving and how it can end up. And then we kind of confirm that when it appears on the consent agenda it comes back for final, that, that all of these things that we weren't able to see in the context of that first meeting were, in fact, taken care of and that the, everybody's in alignment about what the final is. Here we're not going to see the, the final, and, and that's really my only concern. And so I was trying to sort of draw out of you, I mean, how, how big of a concern is that? Um, it doesn't sound like on a project of this scale that there's too much risk in going forward without seeing the final. I mean, we're, we're talking about some basic parameters, keeping the, 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 the same plant list, keeping the same quantities, trying as best we can to take care of some comments that have been put on the record. Um, I'm just trying to make sure that what we do here is consistent with our behavior with other petitioners um, so that there's not this you know, a, a sense that, well, the Muni brings a project through and they can do whatever they want and they don't have to follow proper procedure, um, whereas me, private citizen, tries to do this and I have to jump through a whole bunch of hoops. And we're just trying to be, as a commission, as consistent as possible in, in when we sort of go beyond the rules to allow a single review as opposed to multiple. And, and that's... Uh, through the chair, um, uh, Mr. Doherty. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Do uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, the only review um, that has um, two parts to it, the concept and the final, is the public facility site plan review. All other reviews, every type of work that the planning department does has a single um, hearing, if it has any hearing at all. Um, so uh, uh, the department can handle uh, the conditions uh, that, uh, that the commission develops this evening. 
Okay. So any other questions for the petitioner? Okay. Thank you, guys. Is there any uh, groups that are related to this? No? All right. I guess the matter rests with us, and it's time for a motion. Mr. Sahil. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the case uh, 2009-159, I move for approval of the final site plan uh, and public facility site plan review uh, for the Chester Creek pump station. Subject to staff's conditions one through three, um, I'm going to delete number four, renumber five and five to four and six to five. I would like to add an additional condition, number six, relocate the fence on the south side of the building to approximately 35 feet south of the building. And condition number seven, to update the landscape plan, uh, maintaining the same number of plantings and resubmit the, uh, the plan to staff for approval. That uh, motion has been seconded. Uh, time for discussion. Would you like to speak to your motion? Thank you, Mr. I, Chairman. Oh, we'll give you a chance. Okay. Um, I intend to support the motion. Uh, I think the, the I would agree with staff's uh, analysis that the uh, landscape plan meets the goals and objectives of, of the comprehensive plan and Title 21 requirements. And uh, with that, I'll be supporting the motion. Any other discussion? Thank you. Um, I'd like to comment on item number one. Um, according to their presentation, they, they commented saying they, they required a 20-foot driveway for their vehicle, where uh, item number one is here saying that they have to have a 15-foot. Is that Am I understanding that correctly? Or am I misunderstanding you're, that? I think you're confusing the staff recommendations with the... Uh, I don't... Community Council. With the Community Council. Oh, okay. Re right. Recommendations. I'm sorry. Any other discussion on the motion? Any objection to passing? Hearing seeing none, it passes unanimously. Uh, next, we have case number 2009-160, final site plan and landscape plan approval for fire station number 11 in Eagle River. We have a staff report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is the final site plan and landscape plan review for the um, uh, MOA fire station uh, number 11. Um, this is the first time that the commission um, has uh, seen these plans and it will be the uh, only time. Um, the fire department intends to expand fire station number 11 um, on, uh, out in Eagle River uh, to um, add 2,629 square feet of a single story addition um, that will house a new dining facility, training room, computer room, exercise facility, and three new dorm rooms. This site is owned PLI. The construction budget is 700,000. The landscaping budget will be uh, 11000 of which $8,000 will be uh, devoted to plant material for landscaping. The proposed plannings will be hardy in Zone 3. The firemen will maintain and irrigate the landscaping. Um, traffic and parking will remain the same. Um, the existing landscaping uh, was installed in uh, 2000, and it will be retained. Um, the department recommends approval of the public facility, the final public facility site plan and landscape plan for um, MOA fire station number uh, 11, subject to condition number one on page um, pages uh, two and three of the packet. Thank you. Do we have a presentation? Okay. Any questions of the petitioner? Commissioner Garsha. 
Well, this might not be your field. Do you know what kind of roofing system they're going to be using? Is this a metal roof or a built up or? Oh, uh, you're right. That is not my field. But can you? <laughs> We're the project manager here. It'll be a uh, solid here roofing uh, membrane on top of uh, insulation. Okay. The only reason I was wondering is because the uh, eave on the south side of the new addition is directly over, it looks like a planting bed with shrubs. So I was just wondering about, I was worried about slide, you know, snow slide, destruction of that vegetation. I believe the new part of the building is flat. No, I'm, but the building addition has a, it looked like from the elevation that it had a pitched roof. I mean, it doesn't look like a greatly pitched roof by any means, but on yeah. the, is that the south side? On the south side, you've got that planting bed area, and it looked like you had a bunch of shrubs. I was just concerned that you might have, I mean, that's why I was wondering about what kind of roof material you had due to, you know, if you had some kind of slide, you could pretty much destroy all that vegetation. It looks to me like the roof shoves toward the parking lot and not the planting bed. I'm on, on L2, is that fire station number one, west elevation with landscaping? Right. Isn't that pitching to the right? Oh, you're talking about the opposite side. Right here. Right. The eave side, not the yeah. cable Let's side. Take a look at that. I'm sorry. I, I, I need your name for our record. David Grubbs, project manager with Miss Pouty. Thank you. And then the other the other question I had, although it's probably not much of a big deal, is you've got that curved concrete. Um, is that a, oh, forget that. My bad. No worries. Just read something. <laughs> Oh, oh, sorry, that's all I had. Any other questions for the petitioner? Okay, I guess you've made it very clear for us. Thank you. So, better is back to us. Time for a motion. No one likes to make motions on this. You've got to push a button or yeah, I know. something. Mr. Sawhill. Yeah, it is. There goes Ralph's. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the case 2160, I move for approval of the uh, final review of the public facility site plan and landscape plan for MOA fire station number 11. Subject to staff's uh, condition number one on page two of our packet. Thank you. We have a second. Commissioner Coleman, can you speak to your motion? Um, yes, Mr. Chairman. I would uh, concur with staff's analysis that the planning and design criteria have been met. Um, it's a relatively small addition uh, onto a, a, a well-landscaped site, and I believe the landscaping they are proposing is, is appropriate for the addition and fits in well with the rest of the site, and I intend to uh, support the motion. Anyone else wish to comment? I, I'll just briefly comment that this is another case that we're asked to do a uh, preliminary and final approval and and uh, and I would say that this does meet the requirements it's very straightforward uh, the design uh, as presented uh, seems to meet all of the requirements that we would expect um, for final um, and it's of limited scope and and consistent in design with uh, with the preceding project so I, I intend to support the motion as well anyone else wish to speak if not we see any objection to passing the motion? Hearing, seeing none, motion passes unanimously. Sharon, I don't see any notes on any more of the agenda this evening. Do you have anything that? Yeah, there are a few things. One thing. Um Mr. Garsha has just pointed out that he doesn't have the ability, Jill, can you figure out, he doesn't have the ability to either make a motion or second.
I've never had that. If, it, if you've never had it? Well, it comes up to the time. Do you see how she's not on the floor? And I'm on the floor, and they get... Could, I haven't had that the whole meeting. Let's see. Um, I'm going to have to have my key check the, the default figure. It shouldn't be that way. I have that. It's not a big deal. No, no, but no, you know, it, it, it needs know. to be fixed every time because you can't participate if it's not working. So, um, so yeah, I would sometimes know if you're if you're on an agenda item over here, it's you can't work. do that. But when you're back on the floor, you should be able to. Um, now you can't do it until I hit motion. No, and it's fine, like because like I asked her, I was like, how do you how do you make a how do I make the motion? She goes, you just you just click it. I'm like, how do I second? I'm like, and I went like this, and I'm like, well, I don't work. And then I looked over, and she gets the the box. I don't know. I'll have them check it and find out, and we'll run a test on it, no which we have the ability. To, Tom can do from his desk tonight, right. so we should have a Tom question. Okay. Yeah, um, if it isn't, wasn't just a simple here or there, um, I'm doing that, and we'll check on it. Cool. You know, I, I, I think if you wanted to sort of raise your hand or get <laughs> my attention, we could probably override the system. Yes, we can. I can put it in from here. <clears throat> okay. No worries. So, Sharon, what do you got? Yeah, uh, a few things. Um, and, you know, um, Jill could speak to this tonight, you know, our problems with the consent agenda and how that worked. But... Yeah, we didn't have any other cases, I'm sorry, on the consent agenda. So, yeah, she's right. There's no reason to go back and uh, uh, approve that since the one case on it was taken off. And she's right. We do treat it then as a case that's on their regular agenda. Is everyone clear on that? Or are there any other so questions? Why don't you walk us through if we had three cases on the consent agenda, for example, and we pulled two. Um, so then, then what would we have done? If you had if, if you had three cases on the agenda and you pull two, um, what you do is a motion. You've already done a motion to approve the consent agenda. You pull two of them. You vote on the motion to approve the consent agenda. What that basically approves is the one remaining case. Then you move on to each case, and you need a separate motion, and then speak to the case, and then vote on it. And that's the same for the second case as so well. So the consent agenda is acted on before you hear any of the cases. And that sort of finishes that off. The other cases are handled as regular agenda items. We never have to go back and make a exactly. like, consent agenda action after that point. What, what Robert's Rules of Order basically says about consent agenda items are that anything under the consent agenda has to be approved in total, no changes or any ad additions to them in order to be considered even a consent agenda item. You have to take it off completely if you want to do something else. Right. And we generally don't go down to the regular agenda. We generally just immediately after the motion to approve the consent agenda is approved or failed or whatever, go on to the cases that were pulled. Okay. After we've pulled it off, there's nothing on it. So it's on the regular agenda. That's how we've always done it. We just mm -hmm. then acted on it. We didn't, um, but which I have, thought is what we were doing. My issue was I had an outstanding motion sitting there on the floor. For so for all somebody just and had to withdraw it. Exactly. So that just cleans it up mm -hmm. because, you know, you have a motion sitting there and, and you really need to either withdraw it or fail it, whichever. Withdrawn is simpler, simpler and cleaner, but you just can't leave the motion sitting on the floor, even though there's nothing underneath it based on the follow-up action. So withdrawing keeps it clean. And that would be the case any time that we've pulled everything off the consent agenda there's no longer anything to act on with that motion, so we would always have to withdraw the motion at that point if we pulled all of the cases. In that same scenario, three cases, we pull three cases, we'd still have to withdraw that motion. Right. And there's nothing. It seemed overcomplicated for yeah, making everybody confused. It didn't matter very much. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. And one other thing, in terms of um, resolutions, um, it, it's important, and we haven't really followed this in the past, but, uh, but we probably need to start doing this, is um, during the disclosures portion of, portion of this, if you were absent 
um, or you had a conflict of interest on any case that there's a resolution for, you need to say in, when we're doing the disclosures that I was absent for a case so-and-so, so I will be abstaining from voting on that resolution, or I had a conflict of interest on case so-and-so, so I will be abstaining from voting on that resolution. So many times those resolutions come up on the consent agenda. So um, how do you act on the remaining pieces of the consent agenda that you're not conflicted on? The same, you would just say, I'm abstaining from, from the vote on that one. And then it goes into the record that you're abstaining from that. It's just a verbal on the record. At the time of disclosure. Yes. Okay. Um, and also, a lot of times what will happen is um, that's something I clean up after the fact. Because of the system, it's kind of hard to, to stop and, and change things. But I have notes that I keep on the disclosures, and, we make sh and I make sure, and there's a item in the minutes that say that you disclosed it, and when we get to the consent agenda, it's written there as well. And, um, but typically you don't excuse yourself or anything. You're, you're present for that vote. Um, but you're just, you're just acknowledging on record that you ha either had a conflict or you were absent. So, and, well, I have a question then. Sorry. If, if there's five things, five resolutions on the consent agenda, are you just abstaining from voting to accept the consent agenda? Because you're not doing them one at a time. You're just saying on case so-and-so, you'll just identify which case and saying, I'll, I'll be abstaining from the vote on that. Okay. It's, it's, you're not really voting on that. You're voting on the consent or agenda. I said approval. Um, generally what happens in the minutes, if there's five items and there's only one item that you're abstaining from, your vote to approve the consent agenda is counted in my minutes, but there's a clarification underneath it that you abstained from voting on such and such an item because you had a conflict and it was a previous conflict or a disclosure that pre prevented you, you were excused from participating, if you will. And it would be on the record already. Mm -hmm. uh, just to be absolutely clear, um, we typically see the cases twice. We see a 35 percent and we see a final. If the 35 percent, if you were absent when the 35 percent case, landscape design, was presented, mm -hmm. and, and now it appears in the consent agenda for, for final, is that a time when you would disclose that you were not here for the preliminary? Yes, and what you need to do, I mean, being technical, this is what the other boards and commissions would do, they would ask for uh, a copy of the minutes from that meeting or hear the tapes from that meeting, and they would say, um, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair, I uh, was not present at the June 15th meeting, but I have heard the tapes and I did review the records, so I feel um, able to participate in the discussion of tonight's case. So normally we would have uh, a couple months lag between the two and perhaps right. we would have the minutes approved Right. and reviewed by all of the members prior to that. Right. And if it's, um, and, you know, keep your, your case packet. If you were out of town, keep it because and if it was a concept design because you know it's coming back again. So hang on to your, you know, your packet for that case so you can review it and then come to the meeting and say, I reviewed the project, I read the minutes, you know, and hopefully I've also heard um, the discussion of the case, you know, at concept review, so I feel I can participate in the case tonight. So, and you would have to, you'd have to state that if, if I missed the case, yes. I read up on it and yes. reviewed the minutes and was prepared to act, I'd have to first disclose that I wasn't there and then go on to clarify that I've read everything and will be prepared to act on the consent yeah. agenda. That's what the Planning Zoning Commission does, yes. I guess I'm not sure I agree with that. Because if you've had a concept approval, I'm going to run into this a lot. I'm a new member. Um, and then it's here for final. In the staff analysis, you list all the areas of concern that the board brought up. And I have the final design. So I can read what the concerns are. I can look at the design. And I can make my judgment on whether the, the conditions have been satisfied. So right. I, I believe on a final I could participate even though I was not here for the, for the preliminary. It would be better to have, you know, listened to the tapes and uh, had read the minutes so that you are aware of what discussion took place and why you're looking at the final the way it is and, and you know, and what happened. So I can count on you to provide me minutes for all the cases we're going to get in the next six months? 
when yes, the yeah, we, they do come in your packets, but there has been some delay since but, but, Oh, it's crazy. Part Sometimes. of the staff packet yeah. to have yeah. the minutes from the previous meeting. Right. It may have been a year or two previous yeah. before we saw. Yeah, if it's been packet. some time, yeah. we do include the minutes in the, in the packet. If it's just been a, a lapse of two or three months, I don't normally, because it's still, I, I assume, fresh in the minds of the petitioners. But if it's been a long time that has uh, occurred between the concept and final review, then we do include the minutes. Also, Sharon, I'm not sure. I don't think – have I sent UDC members the link for the, the website for UDC for the – so you can listen on your computer to the meeting? It's not – it's not a oh, really? public – Really? Well, you know, it, it, it's it's better than having to yeah, send having it to, to go down to City Hall to listen. Or, to it. Right. Or, yeah, you can listen it to with our new Granica system. You can listen to it from your office. And, and if I haven't done that, I will make a note to send that to you in the next couple of days. <laughs> and what? And once and once things calm down, and I'm really in a zone with this stuff, what would happen is after the meeting, you would get an email to the link when I posted it. I would send you an email that said to the people absent that they could listen to the meeting to, to know what was going on and be able to participate later if the need be. So, Please tell me that it's digitally recorded and there's a way to play it at three times the normal speed or something <laughs> like that. You uh, can fast forward it, is that right, Jill? Or it's digitally set, you can jump from... What you can do is, is there's links to each case, a timestamp. And so when you click on that case, you will hear that case. If you want to move it, you can't speed, you can't speed it up. You can't speed <laughs> the words up like you could Chip now. Now on my MP3 that I record, and the quality is not as great by any means. Yes, you can. I can. I can send you a copy, and you can speed it up. I can send you uh, an audio of this, and you could download it and speed it up on your own system. Um, I use. Um, but if you were to go online to the website, right. it doesn't have those kind of tools. No, you'd have to download the file. Have, no, you don't. Get, all you do, yeah, you, if you wanted to speed it up, you'd have to download it and manipulate it somehow. I think so, because, because really the only option you have is to click on the link, or there's a little button that you can drag to move through, but it doesn't speed it up. I really like that in our phone system. It's, it, doesn't, it doesn't make it like a chipmunk. It's still the same voices, but they're just faster. Um, anyway, I digress. <laughs> yeah. And then one final thing. Um, Peter Briggs sent me an email yesterday, and James got a copy of it, too. And um, it looks as though he got an email from Jay Jackson in the mayor's office, and, and he's not going to be considered um, for the vacancy uh, on the UDC. So he wanted uh, to pass along his thoughts and appreciated having worked with all of you and uh, because he, he, he didn't get that opportunity to, you know, say, say that. So I'm passing that along for him. And then now we need to consider, not now, but perhaps at the next meeting, um, we'll probably need to vote in a new vice chair. So you all be thinking about that and on, you know, next month's um, meeting will elect a new ch vice chair. Wouldn't we? We haven't had elections for chair for a while. Right, wouldn't right. we? Right, and it, it comes up yeah. in a... I missed, I missed the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't hear that, Rob. Yeah. Um, it comes up again in March. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the, the reason for electing the vice cause it's, it's it's because it's right vacant right now. It's because it's vacant, yes. So we'll need to uh, fill that vacancy. The, the email that I got from Jay Jackson said that we have a full commission. Yeah, and I called up Peter right after I read that, and I said, I don't know if she genuinely is, con genuinely is confused and thinks we have a vacancy. I think she knows we have a vacancy, but she was just her maybe polite, diplomatic way of saying uh, he's not going to be considered. Okay. That's too bad. Any commissioners have anything for us? I, well, then, do, do they have other names? Do you know? I, I, I don't know. I know we encourage them to well, I did send consider a landscape architect. I did. I, no. I, and I sent uh, Jay an email expressing, you know, that the UDC would like to see the vacancy filled with a landscape architect. 
And then she came back, her reply was, well, it doesn't look as though that any seats are absolutely designated for any particular profession. So we don't know really what's going to happen. But if the UDC as a whole or individually wanted to send Jay Jackson the same email saying that there is a need to have a landscape architect on the commission. Which reviews landscape plans. Right. Because, you know, an additional one, I mean, we have Mark, but if Mark is, you know, has a conflict and he's in the room in the back, we don't have a landscape architect to comment on the projects. And that is the need. So I would express that and send an email to Jay and say, we really do need a second landscape architect on the commission. I know a real enthusiastic and willing landscape architect. I have one more question. I have a request. Can we possibly get a portable mic? For six years we've watched people like run over and point and run back to the microphone and run over and point. It just seems silly that people can't do their presentation by their drawings without. Well, the other thing is I was going to send an email to both Elise and Ralph tomorrow and say, you know, Elmo is working now, isn't it, Jill? So why are they using the boards? I mean, it's so 20th century. I mean, we have Elmo for that purpose because, you know, they bring the boards and no one can really see, and that's the whole purpose of having the Elmo is to, is to use it. And so I'm going to send an email tomorrow and say, you know, don't bring the boards anymore. It's, you know, useless. And use the Elmo. That's what it's meant to do. And, and it's easy to do. They, just, you know, they have the drawings this size or even 11 by 17. They could just move it across it to the area they're talking about. And so we're not all trying to strain and see, see the board from this distance. Don't we have those online? So couldn't we just put them up? I mean, don't we get those with our case? Well, a lot of times they have newer, prettier drawings that they want to yeah. show. Um, also, Sharon, a lot of times what they've been telling anybody who wants to use Elmo is they need to come ahead of the meeting so that we can make sure that their system, you know, their little, their laptop or their sheets, of pay, well, the overhead projector generally, generally works, but if they want to use their laptop, we need to have time ahead of time to set it up and make sure it works. Right. It's just the putting a couple of switches on, you know, to make it. That's a, we had somebody show up with a Mac, and it didn't happen. Oh, no, I just, I don't mean a computer link up. I just mean paper. They can bring paper and use it. Overheads. Yeah, overheads. And so, you know, why they're not using, you know, just paper and using it as an overhead, I, I don't know why they're trying to do boards. Okay. That's all I have. Anybody else have anything that they need to discuss? Pressing issues? How about a motion to adjourn? You can do a verbal. <laughs> <laughs> Move to adjourn. All right. Oh. And there it is. There it is. So we'll do an official second since um, we're online. Any objections? No? We'll see you guys next time. Thanks. <laughs>